yeah, we're all thankful, but mostly just for the food. <laughs> but this year was different, at least for me, and maybe for you as well, because for the first time, we weren't able to spend the holidays with our extended family like we normally do. This was the first time in our almost 20 years of marriage that it was just the four of us for Thanksgiving. Never happened before. Because of that, this year, I had a different kind of thankfulness. As I contemplated the week leading up to Thanksgiving this year, I realized that things have been pretty bad for our church family, haven't they? It's been bad for an extended period of time, but then we added some sadness to our own church family in the week of Thanksgiving. We buried two significant church members from our church family, people that have been around here for a long time. Sister Mae Johnson was buried on Sunday. She's been a member here since 1994. And Brother J. Cody Edward, on Wednesday, he and his wife, as we talked about earlier, got married in this church 47 years ago and became members shortly after that. People that have been around for a long time in this church, we are putting to sleep in Jesus. Do you realize that this year, probably unlike other years, maybe in some respects, is harder for us to be thankful around Thanksgiving time. We even have been to Robinson's mother, who's still ill, that we've been praying for, and Linda Moore and, and Brother Phipps, who had surgery. All of these things we're dealing with. Sister Beverly Robinson, who lost her sister just a few days ago. How does one remain thankful in such burdensome times. Well, I believe the Bible has something to say to us specifically about this subject, and I believe that it's possible for us to have an attitude of thankfulness, not just during Thanksgiving, but all the time. I want to see what God's Word has to say about that. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, starting in verse 11 and reading to verse 19. I'll begin in the NIV, and then when we get to our points, we'll switch to the New Living Translation. So for right now, Luke 17, 11 through 19 in the New International Version. Here's what the Bible says. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village... Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. He asked, were not all ten, Jesus asked, excuse me, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Who says amen to God's word today? I'm thankful. This is the fourth and, excuse me, this is the fourth to last chapter in Luke's account of Christ's life. By this time, the word has spread about the power of Jesus. People have heard about his wonderful miracles and his glorious acts of kindness. They know of his authority over diseases and maladies, and they know that he can heal every kind. Enormous multitudes swarm him continuously, relentlessly seeking some magic touch or wonderful word to keep themselves uh, going just one more day. And the beauty is that anyone can be around Jesus. He accepts them all. No matter their race, their gender, or their social standing, all are represented in the crowd. That's it. Well, except... For lepers. Everybody can be in the crowd beside Jesus except for lepers. It's not that Christ does not accept lepers, but on the contrary, 
he loves and accepts them too. Lepers, though, have a legal obligation in Jewish society to remain outside of the town, away from the people, so as to keep the people uninfected and free from contamination. They were under quarantine because leprosy was not just terrible and ugly, it also caused deterioration of the human body and was very contagious. So the leper, according to Leviticus 13.46, was banished to live alone outside the camp. Only lepers could be near other lepers. The legal distance which these unfortunates were compelled to keep from passers-by was a hundred paces. This explains why the Bible says they had to call out to Jesus in the story. They dare not approach him, for it was against the law. And beloved, I'm so glad that Jesus still hears the cries of the sick and diseased from afar off. Aren't you glad about that? Jesus still loves to heal our maladies and to cure our diseases, and he seems to relish the opportunity to make us well, especially when things seem impossible. What happens next provides a remarkable commentary on God's methods and motives in his earthly ministry. It gives us a peek into the human psyche as it pertains to the relationship between faith and thankfulness. Did you know that there was a relationship between faith and thankfulness? I say again, this passage teaches us a lesson about the relationship between those two. All the men in our story had faith, and that is commendable. But only one displayed a heart of gratitude. The leper in our story teaches us three very important things about thankfulness, and I want to point those out to you today. The first is found in Luke 17, verses 15 and 16a, this time in the New Living Translation. Here's what the Bible says. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. Who says amen to God's word today? Here is the first thing that we notice. Here it is. You ready? The thankful leper had enough faith for prayer and for praise. Repeat after me. True thankfulness continues even after the miracle is over. You believe that? Say amen. The lone leper's faith persisted long enough to be thankful. You hear that? But for the other nine, there was faith enough for prayer, but not enough for praise. When the pressure of the situation was on, all ten lepers were penitent and prayerful and passionate toward God. But as soon as they received their cure, nine of them were satisfied and went on with their lives, never even acknowledging their deliverer. But one leper had complete faith because he had enough for prayer beforehand and praise afterward. <laughs> and we need to learn to do both because God deserves both. Who says amen to that today? Now, this is who we are in our reaction to God in our humanness. And this is what we do when we receive his mercy. We are serious about him when we need him. But we don't know how to show him we're thankful when he comes through for us. In fact, very often we doubt him again, even after he just did something great for us. <laughs> and then when things are going well, we usually forget about him altogether. Maybe that's because it wasn't really about God in the first place. All we cared about was getting something from him. It's no wonder so many of us are in a perpetual state of negativity when it comes to the things of God. Maybe because we can't get out of it because we don't know how to be thankful. But this is not the case with the lone thankful leper. 
In his example, we find the picture of true thankfulness when a person recognizes who God is and what God has done. This is an example of authentic faithfulness to God and what it should look like. And it is directly related to an understanding who God is as a person. Listen to me. You must remember that every miracle that Jesus has ever performed has a dual intention. Everybody say dual intention. That means it means two things. It's doing two, it's trying to accomplish two things. The first was to show that Jesus has power over any and every kind of disease or malady that the devil can throw at us. I don't care what you have. Jesus has power to fix it. It could be cancer. I know that one firsthand. It can be AIDS, meningitis, diabetes, COVID-19. Ask Granville about that one. Lupus, a toothache, a sore back. Doesn't matter. Jesus can handle them all. He is the healer. Yes, he is. But the second is more important in its intent, and is that Jesus also has power over sin. So when he does a miracle, he's showing you, I can heal that. There's nothing the devil can throw at you that I can't get rid of. And at the same time, he's also showing his power over sin. Every time he heals someone in the Bible, it is a physical representation of Christ's authority and power over the spiritual realm as well. Christ has power over things seen and unseen. He has already defeated Satan, and Jesus has power over sins, no matter how debilitating they may seem. And I don't care what you've done in your lifetime. Nothing is so bad that Jesus can't take it away. That's why Jesus even raises the dead in the Bible, because he wants to show you there's nothing he can't cure as far as your sin is concerned. I'm so glad Jesus has supremacy over sin with a big S and our sins with a little s. Thankfulness should come from a heart that truly understands God's mercy and grace over areas of our lives where we really deserve the death penalty. Our natural reaction to the grace of Jesus should be thankfulness, and it shows up in three ways with this thankful stranger. He shows praise and worship and adoration. He praises God in a loud voice, the Bible says. He worships him with his posture getting down on his hands and knees, and he shows adoration by throwing himself at Jesus' feet. We should be praising God, not just with what we do, but with what we, how we live. Not with what we say, but with how we live. The thankful leper had enough faith to pray and to praise before and after. Second one, Luke 17 Verses 17 and 18, again, in the New Living Translation. Here's our second point. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Everybody say foreigner. This is important to our second point. The second thing we learn from this leper is that true thankfulness is not dependent upon others around us. But is, but is a personal response that grows out of an authentic experience with God. Repeat after me. I will be thankful to God even when no one else will. If you want that to be true, say amen today. Because <laughs> I know we struggle with that, don't we? Notice some things about this thankful leper. First of all, he was the only one who came back. Now that's obvious. But the leper, leper didn't ask anybody to come back with him. He didn't wait to see who else might suggest they should go back. In fact, the Bible does not even mention that he, was, that he encouraged the others to come back with him. It doesn't say anything about that. He just comes back to Jesus. He didn't caucus with his peers before leaving. He did not call a super committee to discuss the strategy on how they could show collective thankfulness. He was so overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus would heal him that he responded with authentic worship. We saw that already. He did not allow the herd mentality to negatively affect him. Did you hear that last one that I just said? We struggle with that one. He didn't care what everyone else was doing. He knew what he needed to do, and he sprang into action. Of course, it would be good 
if we would be just like this, wouldn't it? But the sad reality is we're not. We can so easily get caught up in what everyone else is doing that we often make wrong decisions because they are not rooted in our relationship with Christ, but instead in our need to feel validated by people. But the thankful leper didn't care about what the others did. He had to get to Jesus because he wanted to show that he was thankful. In fact, dare I say, he wasn't thinking at all. He just kind of responded out of heart of thankfulness toward God. I got to get back and tell that guy what great things he just did for me. Now, he was a foreigner. And this is important because he was actually a potential enemy of Jesus. And I don't mean, I don't mean that he was personally Christ's enemy, but his people group were enemies of Jesus' people group. Now, this is a pretty big obstacle, believe it or not. Luke takes the time to point out the nationality of this lone, thankful leper. The Bible says he was a Samaritan. Everybody say Samaritan. And what we already know about relationships between Samaritan and Jews is that they were bitter enemies and hated each other. I'm not saying that Jesus hated the leper or the leper hated Jesus. I'm saying that Jesus was a Jew and the leper was a Samaritan and those two people groups don't get along. But on this day, the Samaritan was the only one who did the right thing. Now sometimes... We receive unexpected things from unexpected people. And because we don't have an attitude of thankfulness, we don't accept their kindness because they're not like us. You ever been in that situation before? I'm sure you have. This is a wrong attitude to have. The Samaritan leper could have easily disqualified himself from the cure because he didn't want to accept healing from a Jew. But his gratitude was not dependent on other people. It was an outgrowth of his experience with God. Who says amen to that today? Last one, and it's kind of a continuation a little bit of our previous point, but not really. Luke 17, verses 16 and 18. Okay? And this is still the New Living Translation. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. We saw that already. The man was a Samaritan. We just pointed that out. Then verse 18. Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? So now Jesus acknowledges it too. Here's the third thing that we learn. Point number three. Sometimes our closeness to God can encourage us to take him for granted. Let me repeat that and use air quotes this time. Sometimes our closeness to God can encourage us to take him for granted. Now, I don't want you to tune out in this part. Don't change the channel. This part's for you. Repeat after me. Nothing should impact our thankfulness to God. All right, now let's think about this for a minute. The potential nationality of the other nine lepers can be sort of ascertained even though Luke doesn't specifically say where they come from. I think we can figure it out, though. The way that Luke records these two verses is suggestive with regard to the ethnicity of the other nine. It stands to reason that if the one thankful leper is referred to Christ as a stranger, uh, referred by Christ as a stranger in the King James, a foreigner, New King James, I think our NLT just called him a foreigner, foreigner, that probably means that the other nine must have been more familiar natives of the indigenous culture, right? That, that seems like it makes sense. Is it possible that the other nine lepers were Jews? Is that possible? Okay, so the scholars agree that the other nine were likely Jewish lepers. So the first thing that comes to mind is, what in the world was a Samaritan leper doing with these Jewish ones? <laughs> I thought they hated each other. 
Now, here's the thing that this teaches us. Isn't it amazing that we overlook little things like race and ethnicity when we all have a common disease? (laughs) Isn't that crazy how we do that? They were all walking dead, so their culture and their background really had little impact. They all had to be banished to the same area. They could only be around other lepers. So now they were defined by the thing they had in common instead of the thing that separated them. Nine Jewish lepers and one Samaritan. No big deal, because they're not enemies anymore. They have a common problem. By the way, that should be the same with us today. We are all sinners, and we are all in need of a Savior. So we're all the same. I don't care where you come from. doesn't matter how rich you are. doesn't matter what education level you have. It means nothing. We're all the same because we're all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, which means we all need a Savior. So Jesus and his blood unites us in a way that our own familial blood can't even do. Jesus is the Savior. We're all the same. But the other thing that comes to mind is, if they were of the same people group as their healer, that's kind of weird that they didn't offer him thanks. Isn't that weird? Maybe not so much. What's going on here? What does this say about us in our human nature? You know, we refer to ourselves as spiritual Israel a lot. When I say ourselves, I mean We in this Seventh-day Adventist church, we do. Refer to ourselves as spiritual Israel. Maybe, maybe accurately most of the time, even though we don't realize that there's a negative connotation because we see the spiritual, uh, the real Israel having so many problems in the Bible all the time. It just reveals our issues as a church, doesn't it? There are serious implications for us as spiritual Israel. Is it possible that they took Jesus for granted Because he was Jewish? You know, they used to say, salvation is of the Jews. So the Jews of Christ's day were very religious, and their rituals and religious observances spilled over into every area of their lives. Is it possible that they were so intent on receiving the ritual pronouncement of cleanliness from their human priests that they forgot to thank Jesus for his saving act? Could it be that their perceived standing with God was so tied to their ethnicity that they didn't recognize their need for Jesus? We don't need Jesus. We're Jews. We don't need Jesus. We're Adventists. They had enough faith to seek out the master. They had enough faith to obey exactly what he told them to do in order to receive the cure. And the Bible says, as they were obeying, they're headed to the priests, they began, they they were cured on their way. (laughs) They had faith enough to know that he could heal them if he wanted to do it. Yet they don't have enough faith to follow up their reception with the appropriate sign of thankfulness. I'm saying they took him for granted. Probably because they thought they had so much in common. They were so close to Jesus. They thought they deserved what he gave. I told you at the top of the sermon, there's a relationship between faith and thankfulness, didn't I? (laughs) Maybe the Samaritan was the only one of the ten who saw Christ for who he really was. Maybe that's why His heart was moved with thankfulness. He got a glimpse of Jesus. Is it possible that the other nine saw Jesus as a mere means to an end? While the Samaritan recognized him as the true son of God and the only savior of the world? Think about that. Jesus was recognized for who he really was by a non-religious enemy. His appropriate response tells the whole story. The nine Jewish lepers got what they wanted out of Christ, and they went on with their lives. But the Samaritan leper was touched by the deity of Christ and needed to pay him homage. 
So he returned from his healing and got down on his hands and knees and worshipped with his lips and with his body at the feet of Jesus. The thankful stranger recognized God. Now one more thing. There is yet another, another possible translation of Christ's parting words to this thankful foreigner in verse 19. Remember he says, your faith has made you well. We just read that. Well, it turns out in the original Greek, the word well comes from the same root word meaning to save. So as one commentator puts it, the phrase may also be rendered, your faith has saved you. The fact that the Samaritan returned to thank Jesus may indicate that he had recognized and received salvation in addition to the physical healing that all ten had received. So really, the Samaritan got something more than the rest of the group got because of his thankfulness. All they got was a physical healing. But according to this, Jesus pronounced a spiritual healing on the Samaritan as well. Glory to God! Proving one more time that Jesus has power, not just over this sinful realm, but over the spiritual realm as well. He can heal your malady, and he can change you from the inside out. The Samaritan saw what Jesus was really doing. His power over the deadly disease of leprosy was proof of his power over the deadly disease of sin. And the leper was thankful for being saved that day. Ah. So that's how we can be perpetually thankful in every circumstance. If we can only realize what Jesus has done to save the world, never to be able to shake the feeling of thankfulness from every circumstance. I can be thankful all the time, even when I'm going through negative stuff, because I can remember what Jesus Christ has already done. Who says amen to that today? So there it is. We show that we can be like the thankful leper because he had enough faith to pray and to give praise. His gratitude was not dependent on others around him, but it came from a heart that had been touched by Jesus. And his apparent distance from God kept him from taking Jesus for granted. I want to be like that thankful leper today. What about you? Raise your hand if you do. Raise your other hand if you know Jesus can help you with that. <laughs> now look up and say, I surrender. Praise the Lord. Thankfulness is an interesting thing. And I wonder if you really feel it more than just once a year. In fact, I wonder, do you really feel it even during Thanksgiving time? <laughs> it's hard to be thankful in 2020 with all the craziness that's going on around us. But I think it's possible by the power of Jesus Christ, to remember what he has done so that we can have perpetual thankfulness. I want to remind you just for a second of what Jesus Christ did. Let's think about it. Jesus was there on the day that Adam and Eve were created. Jesus, along with the rest of the Godhead, because he's omniscient, knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin against him. And the Bible teaches that before the foundations of the world, that means before our earth was even created, Jesus and the rest of the Godhead had already come up with a plan of salvation. Now the question is, why go through all of that? There's, there's no way Adam and Eve would have known if they had gotten wiped out and Jesus had started over again. He could have done that, right? But Jesus loved Adam and Eve. He created them because he wanted someone to love. And because our God is a God of love, he also had to create Adam and Eve with free choice. That means... God wanted us to love him back, not because he created us to love him or made us love him, but because we just responded with love to him because he is God. That's what he wanted. So when Adam and Eve sinned, the plan of salvation 
kicked in. And so Jesus, many years later, left his throne in heaven and came down to earth. But he didn't come as he was. He came in the form of a baby. That means he had to actually be born of a human mother. Think about that for a second. Not only was he born of a human mother, he had to be raised by human parents. They were responsible for teaching him about himself. <laughs> he learned about the plan of salvation as a kid, as, as, as Mary and Joseph taught him about it. Then at the age of 30, he was baptized. His official mission began. And for three and a half years, Jesus went around teaching and healing and saving people. Then one day, he was betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas. He was arrested and put to death on a cross, the most cruel way of dying that the Romans could think of. Nailed to a piece of wood. While he was on that cross, Jesus took the time to save one more person, a thief who was dying beside him. <laughs> Jesus is dying, still saving people. He dies. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. And then an angel comes from heaven and calls Jesus back to life. Jesus raises on his own volition and goes back to heaven and is right now pleading his own blood on our behalf. Now think about all that I just said. Think about the implications of that. Now think about the fact that we're going through what we're going through now in 2020. Now think again about what I just told you. Does it make you thankful? It should. Jesus went through a lot for us. And he did it so that in every circumstance, no matter what our situation, come what may, we can have a heart of thankfulness all the time. So my question to you is, are you thankful? I'm thankful. I want to be thankful. <laughs> I'm thankful. You can be too. So maybe you are part of a group of people who right now is not safe in the arms of Jesus. Maybe you've never made a decision for him in your life. Maybe you, maybe you did make a decision for him. You were part of his family and, and now you want to come back. Maybe, maybe you just want to join our online family or, or, or you want to become a member of this church. I don't know who you are, but I want to give you this opportunity right now. To say yes to Jesus, whatever that means for you. Don't overthink it. He's talking to you today. You can do it. All you have to do is type in the chat. If you're watching us right now from one of our platforms, just type in the chat, give me Jesus. You know what? This will work if you're watching later. If you're watching live, you can do it now. But if you're watching months or weeks later, that's okay too. You can still type into your chat, give me Jesus. Whether it's Facebook, whether it's YouTube, Maybe it's the worship platform. I don't know. But one of us on our team will see it, and we will get back to you and get this ball rolling. Maybe you want to just go to the link that's on the screen right now, and you can use that. There are several options there that you can avail yourself of. And whatever you decide to do, Jesus sees and knows your decision today. He wants to heal you of your disease of sin. He can do it no matter how bad you think you've been. And he wants to do it today. He's on the edge of his seat waiting for you to make that decision. Won't you decide for him today? Type give me Jesus in the chat. Follow that link on the screen. He'll do it for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the promise that when we come to Jesus and we say we want to be part of your family, you accept us no matter what our situation is. In fact, I believe the reason you died on the cross that way is to show us what your arms look like all the time to us. You have open arms to us no matter what. And it's only when we come close to you that you close those arms around us. 
with a big hug. Father, give us your arms of love today. Remind us that we can be perpetually thankful and bless that man, that woman, that boy or girl who made their decision for you today, whether it was to join you for the first time, whether it was to come back to you after some time being away from you, whether they just want to join this Sabbath-keeping family online as a, as a virtual member or, or to transfer their membership here, whatever their decision was, Father, I'm asking that you would be beside them, that you would bless them, that you would give them an extra set of angels to guard and guide them from this day forward, that, that they would walk uprightly and only after you until you come. And then, Lord, when you come, help them to be saved into your kingdom along with the rest of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone who loves God say together, amen and amen. God bless you. We're so glad that you joined us again this week, and we hope that you will come back next Sabbath right here at 1130. We'll be here live from the sanctuary one more time, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you there. In the meantime, remember that we have some things planned for you this afternoon. We've got our children's church at 1. We have our adventurers, I believe, at 2.30, and our, our pathfinders, maybe at 3.30. Those times may be a little bit off, but that's okay. All you have to do is contact our children's pastor, griselda.job at the tpchurch.org, and she can give you any information that you need about whichever one of those services you want to be a part of later on today. And then we want to give you an opportunity as well uh, to continue to support the Tacoma Park Church the way that you have been doing. Uh, you have been so generous to us during this pandemic, and we thank you for that. We have uh, uh, added some new donors to our list uh, during this time, and we'd love for you to be a part of that group who supports the ministry here of Tacoma Park Church. All you have to do is go to our website, www.thetpchurch.org slash give, and there you will find all of the different ways that you can uh, support the ministry here at the Tacoma Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. God bless you. We will see you next week. We're hoping to see you there right at 1130. And until then, may you continue to walk with God and always remain thankful. God bless.